Dr. Kenneth Cherry and, and Dr. Jimmy Yao, and we have the honor today on May 30th, 2013, to interview Dr. Jerry Goldstone as part of the SVS project on the history of uh, pioneers in vascular surgery. Uh, Jerry, first of all, it's an honor to interview you. It's hard for me to believe how long we've known each other. Uh, it goes back to 1980. Um, were you raised in Oregon, is that correct? That's correct, born and raised. Did you know from the get-go that you wanted to be a surgeon or what, what influenced you? Actually, I didn't uh, know that I wanted to even be a physician and I'm not quite sure how that revelation arose. Neither, buddy, neither of my parents had gone to college. Uh, there were no medical people in my family. Nobody had had an illness that stimulated me, but um, the decision was made when I was in college, and I think it was absolutely the correct decision in retrospect. And you did your medical training at Oregon, is that correct? I, that is correct. That was my hometown, and uh, it was very convenient. And Dr. Dunphy was at Oregon at that time, was he not? Yes, he was. And I, I, I know from my year at UCSF, he was a revered figure uh, by all who knew him. Can you tell us about your time with him? Because I know you followed him. Well, he was uh, a remarkable individual, and I think I became a surgeon because of him and the residents in his program when I was a medical student. Uh, he had a way with people, he had a way with uh, his trainees, and, and he had a, uh, a personality that just made you excited to be around him. Yeah. It was clear that he and his trainees were having a wonderful time doing what they were doing. Yeah. And when I got to my surgical rotation, that was very... Early on, I said, I want to be like that. Yeah. I, I saw in your CV you did a, a fellowship in medicine. Was that part of research, or did, were you considering branching off into internal medicine at one point? Well, as part of our residency, we had a mandatory year in the lab, and I wound up spending two. Um, and I went to Boston to, to study microcirculation and blood rheology. And it happened to be the group there was very active in that field. so. Uh, it was in the Department of Medicine, and I've subsequently been accused of being an internist a number of times, but <laughs> I didn't take that as an insult. <laughs> Nor would I. I think, I think that's a sign of uh, some wisdom. Um, when you finished your training, where was your first job? Uh, I was scheduled to join the Army. I was in the Berry Plan, and in May of the year I was a chief resident, I got a phone call from somebody in the Pentagon who said, we don't need you next year. And so um, I actually stayed at UCSF. Uh, there was a faculty position open at the VA. And so I immediately, uh, on July 1st, went to work with uh, Al Hall and uh, Wesley Moore. Well, that must have been an exciting time. What was it like? Well, it was very exciting. Obviously, being a, uh, a young faculty member, you, know, you felt rather, rather um, confident, but yet rather insecure the first time you were looking around, there was nobody to call for help, although, you know, Wes was always around. It was a phenomenally good experience. The VA was a place that had lots of uh, patients, uh, they had lots of resources, and they had a separate research program that, for young, academically-minded faculty, was a, a great way to get started on a laboratory career. Was Dr. Blaisdell there at that time also? No, Bill had already moved to San Francisco General. Okay. Uh, but, um, it, you know, Wes was, was uh, very, very good to work with. He was very organized. He was very helpful, and, uh, and, and I learned a lot from him during that experience. Did you have much experience with Dr. Wiley over at Moffitt at that time? Well, not so much in those years. Uh, I did as a resident, and then subsequently uh, we developed a, a fairly good relationship, but not as much in those initial years as a faculty member because the institutions, although they were the same uh, and integrated for training, the practice uh, patterns really didn't cross. Yeah. And you ended up uh, staying there for how many years before going to Arizona? I was there for eight years yeah. and then um, got recruited to go to uh, Tucson, which um, at the time I thought would be a great opportunity. In my opinion, it was uh, one of those grade B medical schools that was on the verge of moving up into a, a grade A medical school. Yeah. Uh, there was a research group there that was very prominent in microcirculation, which was my research interest, and uh, it just seemed like the right thing to do at the time. 
Did you enjoy your time there? We had a very good time. Uh, you had a fellowship there, I know that. We had a fellowship, but of course in those days it was uh, the undocumented or unregistered uh, type of fellowship. Yeah. But um, no, there was an active program. Uh, we had uh, lots of clinical material. We had a lot of fun. And uh, I think things grew. Uh, there were issues that came up towards the end of my tenure there that made me think maybe it was, it was not going to make the next uh, jump. But uh, the crucial thing was, ultimately, when Dr. Wiley died, it created an opportunity to go back to San Francisco. And when you went back to San Francisco, for a while you were interim chief of the whole department, were you not? That happened, uh, I think, the year after I got there, when Paul Ebert decided to leave yeah. and become director of the American College of Surgeons. Uh, I was asked by Rudy Schmidt, who was the dean in those days, to run the department for a year. Yeah. How many years were you uh, chief out there in San Francisco? Of, of vascular surgery? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, well, I think about seven or eight. Yeah. Was it a pretty exciting time? It was an exciting time. That yeah. was, um, there were, it, it was the beginning of the endovascular yeah. revolution, and we were part of the phase one and phase two trials with the EVT device. Yeah. And I can remember still the first uh, endograft we put in, there were, I think, 17 people in the operating room. Yeah. And uh, there were some that were not particularly supportive and were, <laughs> you know, were making cat calls. They could have done it quicker open because in those days the EVT device was a tubular device. So they were pretty straightforward aneurysms, you know, right. good proximal neck, good distal neck. And big delivery devices. Very big delivery devices. And yeah. I, fortunately, they had a phenomenally good group of interventional radiologists led by Ernie Ring, and they yeah. were very helpful. And uh, we learned a lot from them. Did you bring Tim uh, Shooter in? No, Tim, I think, was recruited um, towards the end of my tenure there. Yeah. And uh, I was involved in the recruitment process. Yeah. And, and it was clearly a step forward. I mean, he had done yeah. an awful lot of work. Uh, with particularly with a, with a, a bifurcated device, which uh, I don't think was on the market yet by the time when he got there. And, um, and then you had an opportunity in Cleveland and, and went for that. That's correct. And how, how did that work out? Was that good? Yeah, I think it was very good. It, it was a place that if someone would have said, as they did actually, yeah. would you like to look at this job in Cleveland? The answer was, don't be ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but things change in institutions and... Um, uh, I thought it was a, an opportunity to do some things, particularly uh, in the area of outcome stuff. And I, in my presidential address, I talked about quality improvement and that sort of thing. And they had a group there that seemed to be very interested in that. And it's, again, I thought a change was, um, was, was good and it was, uh, turned out to be a very interesting uh, place. I'm still there. It's grown. Uh, there are a lot of interesting things going on. Uh, and we've not uh, once regretted making that move. You've been a leader and practice clinical vascular surgery in three distinct areas of this country. Uh, the Southwest, the West Coast, and now the Midwest. Are the patient populations different? Are the practice patterns different in your mind? Are there any distinctions that come to mind? Well I, well, I think the times have changed. And so it may be more of a function of the different times rather than the different patient populations. I think one thing about Cleveland is there's a very high incidence of obesity. So there, there are way more obese patients there than I saw anywhere else. In yeah. Cleveland, there are patients with chronic visceral ischemia who are obese, yeah. uh, which is contrary to anything you read. Yeah, Jeb Hallett, uh, this is egotistical and I apologize, loves to quote me in, when they talk about obese patients with chronic mesenteric ischemia. He said, well, Ken Cherry says, if they're still obese, they haven't had it long enough. <laughs> so Probably there you true. Go. Probably true. Yeah. When you look at your career, what are the things you're proudest of? I mean, the things that you think, I mean, you've, you've authored so many articles. Uh, you're an honorary fellow of the Royal College of uh, Surgeons from Edinburgh. Uh, what are the things that you're proudest of as you look back at your career, which really has spanned uh, both the uh, high point of the open era and now the end of Asco era? Well, I, I think the things that I will probably think most uh, fondly about are the influence on younger people. Yeah. And uh, I think I've had 
uh, 51 fellows now that I've been involved with their training and and I think watching those people grow and mature into successful practitioners and leaders has been an extraordinary sense of um, I'm not sure accomplishments the right word, but I guess pride is the word and um, and I think that's been really the thing that is most interesting and, and gratifying and the other is I think I've been a person who can bring people together and I've had a lot of opportunities to work in groups and committees and a lot of them have been interdisciplinary or intersocietal and avoid a lot of the rancor uh, and, and try to get common uh, agreements and, and um, people to alter their, their rigid positions into ones that are less rigid and more uh, conciliatory and moderating. When you look at, you talk about training your fellows and, and the pride of that, and obviously our training paradigms have changed considerably. We've had an endovascular revolution. We've also had the 80-hour work week and all that that entails. Um, and you have been on the RRC. RRC. Um, do you have any views about where we're going with the training of our fellows and and, and what we can do to preserve the uh, open skills that people like you develop through the years so that not only we maintain them but actually advance them rather than see them languish and, and die. I think, I think there are many challenges in, in our educational systems at the moment. Uh, there's clearly more to learn. Uh, our field has obviously grown exponentially uh, in all the different things we're doing. We were really Again, the endovascular practice is a totally new thing for us in the last 10 years. The diagnostic, not only just ultrasound, but all the imaging modalities that we now use so intimately. Uh, and, and so there's way more to learn. Uh, it seems like there's less time in which to learn it. And I think those present real challenges. The 80-hour work week is... Um, something that was mandated. Uh, I was on the RRC when it was uh, instituted. Uh, nobody seemed to like it uh, from the surgical RRC, but it was mandated from the ACGME. Uh, I think everybody's accepted. I think it's unlikely it'll ever change. And those that point out the fact that there's not been a single documented uh, bit of evidence that it's actually improved patient safety uh, point out that the reason that that's so is that we haven't shortened the work week enough. I, I just don't see how it's possible to adequately train people to do what we do in less time. So I think we're, I think we're going to be stuck with it and, and we're going to have to be uh, creative in finding ways of improving uh, the education within that framework. Uh, as far as the open skills, it's interesting that uh, even, you know, those who, and, and you talked about, you asked about the uh, five-year program, and one of the sort of upfront criticisms of the five-year program was, well, uh, the residents aren't going to really develop enough open surgical skills because they're going to only have, you know, quote, two years of core surgery. But, but open surgery in terms of general surgery isn't what it used to be either. It's, sorry, it's largely too. being replaced by laparoscopic surgery. And I... I've seen any number of general surgeons now that, that are laparoscopic specialists uh, who are seemingly afraid to do major open abdominal operations. Or they'll do everything they can, it seems, to avoid making a big incision in the abdomen. So, uh, and I think the same is happening in, in vascular surgery. So I don't know, and I don't think simulators are going to solve that problem. I think simulators are very effective at learning core skills. I think endovascular stuff is ideally suited for simulators because you can really simulate with the fluoroscopic uh, images you don't and some of them even have haptic feedback so you can you can tell if you're pushing against something I think it's a little bit more difficult to simulate open surgery and there are ways of getting around some of the things you can use cadavers I think for difficult exposures uh, cadavers don't bleed uh, and and it, it so it, it's not quite as good. Um, and I think what's going to happen is I think there are going to be specialized centers that people that that can go 
and learn perhaps from uh, places where they accumulate large volume of complex cases. Do you think that there will end up being post postgraduate uh, fellowships in aortic surgery and aortic branch surgery, things like that, or? Well, I think there are always individuals who want more, who want more training in a yeah. specific area, and and I think they will find those areas. Whether they will become formalized or not, I think is uncertain to me. Yeah. But certainly, uh, in the very large centers, uh, you know, and somebody that wants to be an aortic surgeon to go and spend some time, and and you can learn tricks. Uh, we had one of our cardiac surgeons in San Francisco spend, I think, three months in Houston. And he, and he came back, and he was a very competent surgeon when he left, but he, he came back and, and basically cut his operating room time by a third because of things he learned by watching some people that had done thousands of cases. Yeah. So I think there's uh, a real opportunity for those kinds of uh, things to enhance people's training. I don't know about the issues where uh, if somebody, say, wanted to come to your aortic center and, and become highly skilled at some specific aortic thing where the opportunity for them to actually participate in those kinds of cases uh, because of credentialing and licensing and malpractice may be somewhat limited. And, and the necessity to train the people you have uh, contracted to train already. Yeah, and, but again, that's where the, yeah. the very high volume centers will likely be able to provide so, those kinds right. of experiences. Jimmy, you had some questions that you wanted to yeah, ask. Yeah, uh, first I'd like to thank Jerry to come to, for the interview. You are one of the leaders in vascular surgery. So we are going to learn something from you. I read your presidential address. It's a very well written. You seem to have a great admiration for Sony company. You know Sony, a couple days ago in New York Times saying they are losing so much money they might split the company. They are not really doing that well. Are you still a, a great admirer for the company? Well, I was, I was an admirer for the way Sony went about their business in the early days. Um, I'm not sure I even had a Sony product when I wrote that talk, but, <laughs> but they were known as, as a company that, that made products that were very good and that were on the leading edge, and they practiced this uh, you know, continuous quality improvement where little by little they kept improving things. Uh, so um, I don't know what's happened to Sony uh, at the moment, but I think in, in the 60s and 70s uh, and 80s they were... Uh, a model company, they made outstanding devices, and, and the way they went about it was the, it was a paradigm, uh, not a paradigm, but it, it was a metaphor for how I thought we could uh, manage healthcare things by managing the processes of care that we are engaged in. Maybe we should be praised with Apple and Google. Well, Apple's <laughs> getting in a little bit of trouble these days too, and Google's become a a controversial company in many ways. Well, Jerry, the other questions I have is about American Board of Vascular Surgery. I have been involved in all these interviews for 56 interviews now. There have been very little talk about American Board of Vascular Surgery, the independent board. I think it's an important part of our history, and I would like to have you talk a little bit about uh, your perspective on the American Board of Vascular Surgery. Well, I think the American Board of Vascular Surgery was, um, was a bold step. Uh, you know, at that time uh, in the leadership group, there were, there were lots of areas of discontent with the current political situation involving the American Board of Surgery and relationship with vascular surgery as an entity with the American Board of Surgery. And I think everybody probably would have agreed on our side that we had no control and very little input into, uh, for example, the vascular qualifying examinations, uh, the vascular certificates, uh, the vascular training programs. And, and there was this sense that everything was being dictated by the ABS, which was largely general surgeon uh, controlled. And so, um, we had many meetings at the time with Wally Ritchie, who was the director of the ABS, 
and some other people and tried to negotiate certain changes and, and essentially not much was happening. And, and what Wally kept saying is that, well, the directors said no, or the directors don't want to do this. Um, and finally, one day, uh, the idea was hatched that maybe we ought to form, just form an independent board. And so at a meeting of eight, eight of us, and I don't remember exactly, it was the presidents, past presidents, I think secretaries and past secretaries of the then two societies, we met at the American Airlines Club in Chicago at O'Hare International Airport and, and agreed to incorporate the American Board of Vascular Surgery. That was in, in mid-September and we also agreed that we would say nothing about it to anybody until the American College of Surgeons meeting that was gonna be held in October in San Francisco. And the reason was they wanted to, to notify the appropriate you know, high level people in the board and the college uh, that this was gonna happen so they didn't read about it in the newspaper. And as you know, it turned out to be a very contentious and divisive event for our specialty. There were uh, many people in the organization that felt very strongly that we should separate from the American Board of Surgery and there were I suppose an equal number of people who felt strongly that we should work within the American Board of Surgery. Even though there were two large surveys of the membership uh, and I think 75 percent said we should form an independent board. But unfortunately uh, it got politicized and I think um, really damaged a lot of friendships and a lot of the collegiality for which I think vascular surgery was known. I mean we used to have you know wonderful meetings and wonderful relationships and everybody got along and it really created some very very unfriendly situations. Ultimately after the application for the board failed at the um, uh, I guess there's some coordinating committee from the AMA and, and the uh, specialty societies and the appeal was turned down. I think the, it gradually uh, faded away but during the process of those years uh, I think that most of the things that we thought were important to us and at one time there was a 14 point memorandum. These are the right. things that we think that as an independent board we should have I think we got all of them except the one thing, which was the independent board. Yeah, true. And, and even further to that, I, I think give credit to the American Board of Surgery. I think they have gone a long way to giving us functional independence. I mean, we're not strictly independent, but there's an American Board of Vascular, or a board of vascular Surgery within the ABS that essentially makes up the exam, determines the pass rate, sort of decides on all matters of vascular surgery. And now with this score program, you know, the, the, the curriculum for surgery in general, it's defined vascular surgery in very simple terms relative to what the general surgery residents are expected to learn. So I think we really have all that, all that we really need as an independent board, uh, but without necessarily being independent and in fact, there were some situations in which I think the, the power and the size of the ABS were very helpful to us. Uh, for example, when the American, um, uh, the cardiology board uh, tried to, uh, s to put into their training curriculum uh, peripheral vascular interventions, uh, it was through uh, the board that helped write a very strong letter of opposition to the, um, the uh, American Board of Medical Specialties saying, they want to put this in their training requirements. They don't have an educational program for it. And it, and it was initially turned down. So I, I'm not sure we would have been able to do that on our own. True. Uh, True. I, I, think, I think what we did was very, turned out to be very important. Uh, I feel badly that it created so much animosity and some of which still exists among certain individuals. But I think it's, it's largely a thing of the past. I think vascular surgery came out stronger for it. I think the American Board of Surgery is stronger for it. I think, um, uh, I think both sides actually won. I was not involved, but I 
At that time, Dave Nauble was in charge of the American Board of Medical Specialists. Nauble was our chairman. Right. He retired, his office was just next to me. So we talk about this all the time. And I know then, there's no American Board of Surgery not going to let us as independent. Just judging by conversation with him many, many times, I know they would love to have the support or like what we have right now under the umbrella or American Board of Surgery. They are talking about eventually develop a board for surgical oncology, critical care, trauma, and so on. And I think that's, I think we've been the model for a number of yeah, things like true. that. I mean, so. the Certificate of Added Qualifications, which I think we were either the first or second group to have that. And, and that's why I, say I think the American Board of Surgery has come out better because of this thing. Um, I think there were those that wanted to push it and get into legal battles, uh, which would have been very expensive. And I don't think anybody had the stomach for that kind of prolonged uh, legal battle, nor did we have the budget for it. Do we have an office called American Board of Vascular Surgery in Chicago? A real office? Well, I don't think there's any such office in Chicago. There, I was told there was an office there. I'm not aware of that. You mean back when the, when the debate was going on? Yeah. I was told there was an office and there's a consultant was hired. Well, there was a consultant, and I forgot the gentleman's name, but yeah. and he may have had an office in Chicago. I'm, I'm going to ask Jim Stanley about it. He, he would know. I'm, I'm always curious about how much money the society has spent on this American Board of Vascular Surgery. Well, all the money, of course, came from the SVS, and the irony yeah. was that in some of these debates, it was a lot of the SVS leadership that were on the side of not having an independent board, but yet they were funding the process of trying to develop an independent yeah. board. I was told there was an office. Have you heard about it, Ken? I, at the time, I did hear that there was an office, but I don't know. Well, but it may be, I, I'm trying to remember the gentleman's name, uh, and it may be that, and he had been, I think he'd been the executive director of the American Board of Emergency Medicine when, it, something, when yeah. it became its own independent yeah. board. And I, I suppose he could have had an, his own office. Maybe he's a consultant and, and, you know, it's like these offshore banks in the Cayman Islands. It's just a mailbox, but it, your address is the Cayman Islands. So the American <laughs> Board of Vascular Surgery might have had an, an address in Chicago, but I don't think there was ever any real um, office type activities that were occurring there other than what was going through the, the, the group. And um, I think it's, it's probably fine that, that it's now a, a, a part of our history. Uh, and I think that, as I said, I, I really think as a, as a profession, we're better off because of, of the arguments and the yeah, debates true. and the changes that occurred. And I think the board is much stronger. True. Let's change the subject. One of the other issues that I didn't see a lot talk about is a woman in surgery. You know, 40% of our medical students are female now. There will be more and more female going into surgery. What we, can, what we should do to help the female to go through surgery with family, marriage, pregnancy, and all this. You have any suggestions or any recommendations? what we need to yeah. do. Yeah, well, first of all, half the class or more medical school classes are now yeah. women. And I think we ought to recruit them just like we recruit everybody else. Um, they're phenomenal women, just like they're phenomenal men uh, in, the, in the younger populations that are coming through school. I think I've trained eight female fellows, probably more than anybody else. Uh, I have a woman fellow starting in July and another one we just matched for the following year. So. Uh, I've had a fair number of, I mean, a fair experience with women fellows, and uh, they're certainly comparable to the men. Uh, there are some separate issues. There are issues uh, that I haven't really had to deal with yet in the women that I've trained, but the woman who's starting in July has a family, 
and her husband's, a, a, I think, a thoracic resident. So I don't know what's going to come up, but I think there, we have to be flexible and we have to be understanding. Uh, I mean, it's a fact of life. There are women that I think excel in our profession. Uh, I think they should be encouraged, and we need to do what we need to do to make sure that, that they're adequately trained and, and are successful. I have first-hand experience. My daughter is, is a surgeon. I can see how she went through all these problems. With he has three, she has three kids. To bring up three kids plus all the things that she had to do. So, so I, I can remember one year in at UCSF. I think five of the six categorical interns were women. This year at the University of Virginia, three of our four chief residents are women. And the comment that typically was made was, well, you know, the women have got to be better than the men to get selected, but these five were better. I mean, they were phenomenal. And, and, and so I've, you know, my, for my money, the women and the men are interchangeable. I mean, I, I don't... I, I, think, I think that there are, uh, and I agree with you entirely. I, when I was at Mayo Clinic, I hired two staff members and our youngest staff member at Virginia is a woman. There are, and, a, and, a, and you have to be careful because you don't want to sound patronizing at all, but my partner faces problems that I never had to face, you know, about child care and, and the child needing their mother and things like that. And, and so she works harder to do the things that she does than I ever did when I was at that comparable stage. And you have to recognize that. And like you say, somehow, help ameliorate it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I think that being a mother is an extraordinarily challenging job. And, you know, we've all had children, but I think it's different oh. being the mother. And, uh, and so we just have to be willing to accept it and, and, and learn to deal with it. The other area is the demographic changes. You know, in our medical school, close to 50% of the students are Asians, and our patient population are changing, and more and more Latin Americans are coming into the country through all sorts of things. So, to me, our society need to start, you know, do some planning about all the demographic changes, the woman issue, the the Asian populations and the Latin American population coming in, the disease pattern may be different. I think it's a very challenging situation in that regard because, as you said, not only are the disease patterns perhaps different, but their social mores are different and their customs are different. And, and we just have to learn to deal with them. Uh, a big issue at, at the most practical level is how do you, how do you communicate with some of these, these people that... Uh, for example, in the West Coast, there are people with Asian languages that, of which there are very few people can understand them. And, and I personally think that being able to communicate with patients is a fundamental attribute of physicians. A and there are more mistakes being made, in my opinion, because we don't get the right history or we don't get the right information from the feedback from the patient or we don't interpret it correctly. And, and I think it's largely or some of it is patient related, but some of it's physician related. I think if, and we have a lot of non-English speaking physicians, non-native English speaking physicians in this country. I think we have an obligation to make sure that they can communicate effectively. So I think it, it's, it's gonna affect all aspects of our life in this country. Obviously, healthcare is a, a very high concern because of the implications. Uh, but I think we just have to learn to be a, very adaptable and very broad thinking in, in uh, how we approach this. Perhaps a continuation of that or, or perhaps a change of topic. Do you have any, and this is really not a fair question at all, uh, do you have any idea of how the so-called Obamacare is going to affect us as vascular surgeons? Any, any uh, concrete thoughts about where we'll be going with Medicare payments and things like that? I really, first of all, I, I will confess, I've not read the Obamacare legislation. Nor did the people puts, who which, wrote it. Which puts <laughs> me in a large majority. Yeah. I really don't know what is actually going to happen. Yeah. My sense is, though, that for all physicians, 
except perhaps primary care people, uh, our level of um, compensation is going to go down. Uh, I don't think uh, the country is, is going to want to afford um, to pay for a lot of the things that uh, we're going to be asked to, to do. So we're easy targets, in my opinion, and um, I, I, other than that, I can't really comment. I, no. I guess my, my overall impression is it's not going to be good for us. You know, I was told, and, and I don't have the facts, that, that this year for the first time the number of female applicants to med school had peaked and was actually going down now. Uh, you know, and in the past people have said that these uh, societal changes to medicine uh, in which men were not applying to med school at the same frequency they were before were being offset by the by female applicants, but now I'm told by people that know far more than I that that may not be the case any longer, that all applications may start to tail off a bit. Well, I, I don't know the numbers, but I, I do know that the number of applications to medical school this year was still higher than it had been. So yeah. people are still applying to medical school, and yeah. I suppose you could argue, you know, for altruistic reasons, they're doing it because they want to be physicians and, yeah. and, and help others. Um, I, I think they're going to be challenging times. Jerry, you know, we have the O5 program now. It's the zero 05 program. How we evaluate them? When they finish, how, how do we evaluate they are really just as good as the five and two program? Well, I, I think it's a question that everybody has struggled with. Nobody, nobody knows. There, I think there have been two, two people that have finished the zero 05 programs, to my knowledge. I think it's a giant experiment. I think it's up to the programs to try to make sure that the trainees are as good as they possibly can be. Um, when you think about it, all of the vascular training programs require three years of training in vascular surgery. Even the five and two, you had to have somewhere in that five years of general surgery a year that could be considered vascular. And in the five and zero programs, or the zero and five programs, two of the years are core surgery and three are strictly vascular. So in some ways, that experience, the vascular experience is the same, where I think the difference is going to become is that the 05 residents are not going to have that same chief resident experience that I think is very important for a lot of reasons. You know, leadership, team management, uh, decision making, and some of those things that I suppose they'll they'll get those as the fifth year vascular resident, but what's going to be most difficult, I think, is for the faculty people who are used to dealing with people that have finished a five year general surgical curriculum to now deal with people that are right out of medical school. It's a very different educational responsibility that we have, and the challenge. I think we can do it. We just have to figure out the best ways and the best means to do it. Everybody that finishes surgical training, in my opinion, is not the best they're ever going to be. I think all of us, those first few years in, in practice, learn things, you know, you fine tune sure. your skills, yeah. you develop better judgment, <coughs> and you got better. So I would expect that the 05 residents are going to be in the same category. When they come out, they're not going to be finished products, uh, but they're going to be certified as meeting some minimum standard and and they'll work with senior people most of them won't be uh, independent and they'll hone their skills and refine their judgments and figure out what they do best and what they don't do best um, and you know i i would say people like me who want to sit here and say you know they're not going to be as well trained as i was um, I, I i would like all of us to be proven wrong i think they will be well trained but they'll be different. But the practice of surgery is different. So um, I think that they'll turn out to be very competent practitioners. Have you uh, and Linda given any thought to what you will do in your retirement and, or, or when you might retire? Well, retirement's coming soon. Um, you know, at age, Welcome to at, the group. At age 72, you can't do this forever, yeah. uh, nor would I want to do it forever. And uh, the better part of my spare time thinking the last year or so is what it is I want to do. 
Uh, I've got a lot of things I'd like to do to be active, um, and healthcare is the only thing I really know much about. Uh, I certainly don't feel the need to practice medicine any longer, but I'd like to be involved in um, maybe innovations, uh, device uh, development is interesting to me, uh, you know, quality improvement issues are interesting to me, uh, and maybe also taking some time to do things that I never took the time to do when I was uh, working, you know, more than 80 hours a week. <laughs> Jerry, what do you think about the impact of endovascular surgery on research? In the 80s, you know, we, the training is only one year, so we kind of make resident, make fellow do some one year research. After the endovascular surgery, the society changed the fellowship two years. So people are uh, more go to that two years instead of doing a year of research. As a result, the research is kind of declining. What, what, what we should do about it? Well, I, I don't know what we can do about it. I think the um, part of the issue is the trend of, of the millennials, if you will, they don't want to spend eight years or nine years in training. And um, yet there's, there, there must be a cadre of people who want academic careers and, and who want to do research and will take the, the time to do it. But I, I think it, part of it's a funding issue. There isn't as much funding to support uh, the kind of laboratories uh, that we had, in some places had at least, to, to have fellows working. And second of all, I think, and maybe more importantly, there's this enormous pressure from everybody uh, at the business level of healthcare is to be productive financially. So, uh, you know, the situation we face, at least in our institution, is they talk about research as being a very important part of the mission of the institution, but they want to know is how much time you spend in the clinic and how much time you're spending in the operating room and oh yes, I've, I'm doing research. Well, we don't care about that per se because we want to know if you're meeting your RVU state, your RVU um, criteria. So I, I think that's a, a, a somewhat pervasive thing across the country where the focus is on income generation rather than academic productivity. There may be some institutions that are less far in that regard, but I think that's one of the big issues that seems to discourage people from wanting to spend time in the laboratory. My last question to you is, what would you tell the young surgeon when they first start going into vascular surgery? What, you, what, what, what are your advice to them? This is somebody who's already finished their training or, or somebody who's thinking of going into vascular? Thinking going into and finish. Well, it's obviously, it, it's a dynamic, exciting specialty. Uh, there's so many aspects about it that that can challenge you both mentally and, phys and, and physically. Uh, there are tremendous rewards, there are tremendous opportunities, I think, in terms of, of challenges, both in terms of numbers of patients and the kinds of problems that they present themselves with. And clearly, we haven't got all the answers. So there are tremendous opportunities to discover new things, to discover new ways of doing things. Uh, and so the future is, you know, I think it's, it's more unlimited than it's ever been. And there'll be a need. So I, I think it's a very exciting time to think about the vascular disease as a, as a career. It was a pleasure and an honor uh, to help interview you. Thank you for coming. The pleasure and honor was mine. Thank you. Okay.